Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com runs down the major markets. After weeks of record highs, there was a bit of a pause this week. However, gold hit a new record high and silver is now showing some life. Ross also takes a look at crude. Dr. Mark Faber joins us from Thailand to discuss why gold should be part of your portfolio, inflation versus deflation, and efforts by governments like Canada's to take away your right to free speech. Founder of the Trendletter.com, Martin Straith examines interest rates, bonds, and the rotation out of high tech into natural resources. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have a company showcase update from the Director of Marketing for Recyclico, Tony Mitchell. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can find him on X at Charts by Ross. Welcome back to the show. Always a pleasure to be with you, Jim. What kind of action did we see on the stock markets this week? Uh, well, you know, it, it's um, good action on the upside the early part of the week, and then they all gave back uh, the middle of the week, uh, but overall... You know, you're still sitting up around all-time highs. The only um, index that really had a tough time was the Dow. I think it had uh, its worst four days of the year. Uh, came back a little bit on Friday, but still overall a down week. But uh, the other indices looking not too bad out there. Um, I did get some nice oversold readings. I, I have what I call a springboard. That's when you get a... A minor oversold reading in an uptrend, um, and usually what happens, you go back and retest the highs. Now, the key here is that you need to go back and retest the highs. If you falter off this oversold condition, then the probability is that you're going to have a bigger relate to the downside and something um, you know more in the five percent or level or more. So. We, uh, we've seen that in the S&P and the Dow, um, these good readings, and uh, the key now will be how the market reacts next week. Uh, you know, do how do we do with earnings reports, and um, does it uh, turn into a rolling top? Um, you know, we are getting to the end of the best six months of the year, so how we have to be um, cautious of that. What's going on with gold? Well, more than happy about that one, I'll tell you. Um, the pattern that we've been looking at is uh, the one that uh, precedes uh, breaking out to uh, all-time highs, like in 1979 and, and in 2009. Um, you know, we've been monitoring the uh, the action since uh, the middle of last year. Uh, it was just leading up to this breakout got a bit of hesitation a month or two ago, um, but uh, now it's uh, it's good to see this. The uh, We have a series of targets on the upside. Uh, the first one was met uh, 10 days ago. We had a little pause there, and uh, now the spot price is up within about $15 of the next target. Um, ideally, uh, we see a bit of a correction here, uh, and then I've got, you know, two numbers that are considerably higher than that and you know we could be looking at uh, as early as uh, next summer or this summer or uh, maybe into 2025 before we hit the the upper the big upper numbers there but for now it's just walking itself up very nicely a couple of really good days at the tail end of the week and you know this is uh, doing it uh, without any real downside action in the U.S. dollar uh, the dollar index 
uh, has uh, been doing, you know, a fair amount of consolidation. You know, we look at it, it's almost a year now uh, that the dollar index has been stuck at this 104 plus or minus a bit. And uh, this week, 104.28 at the, the end of things. Uh, so without any downside pressure in the dollar, there's nothing there to help push the um, the gold market up. The uh, the big one on the week uh, was the silver market. It, we've been looking at $26 as a key level uh, of resistance and thinking that uh, once it starts to go, uh, that we could see some pretty big action. And uh, silver did has uh, the best move uh, that we've seen in a long time. Um, you know, three, four great days here. We we uh, started at uh, 22 and a half a week ago, and here we are at uh, 25 uh, on the uh, the SLV. And if we look at the uh, uh, the actual spot price of uh, silver, we've gone from 22 and a half to 27. So um, nice action there. We haven't seen anything like this in silver in quite a while, and uh, you know we're looking for maybe some interim highs in both of these precious metals uh, next week, a bit of a pause, and then ideally um, a run into the summer. So uh, let's uh, let's enjoy this uh, bull market uh, while we have it. What's going on with crude? Uh, crude is continuing to move along just just beautifully here. Uh, the, uh, the seasonal low was in place. The rally uh, on the, the seasonal move is good. We are five weeks into what we look at as a sequential pattern and uh, out of the base that we have uh, we go back and look at that style for the last 20-25 years uh, we've got seven or eight that are similar to this and the run at this point um, takes us up technically Uh, we should have ideally another uh, three weeks in this run Um, and you know who knows where we're going to stop we're at 86 and change right now uh, we could very well be into uh, the low 90s before this run uh, runs out of steam. And if you take a look at uh, the stocks, uh, the ETFs here, the uh, the XLE, uh, the US one, uh, we're looking at multi-year highs right now. It is just actually leading the oil market on the upside. And uh, on the Canadian side, the XEG, the same thing. Uh, we're back to the levels that we saw back in 2007, 2008, when oil was up at that $150 level. So the uh, the uh, shares are just doing a, a great move here. And until you start to see uh, the uh, oil market uh, hit up to its technical levels and maybe see some divergence in the uh, uh, in the stocks. Um, you want to enjoy this run. I mean, yes, uh, it's been just a phenomenal move. If you take a look at that XEG, we were at $15 uh, back at the beginning of uh, February. Now we're sitting at 19 and a half. And I think just looking at the chart, there's been two or three down days. There hasn't been more than one down week since this thing went. So uh, clearly uh, doing as well as uh, NVIDIA was doing. Ross, thank you so much for the update. Pleasure to be with you, Jim. My guest has been Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com. Check him out on X at Charts by Ross. Coming up, Dr. Mark Faber next on This Week in Money. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Mark Faber, editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report online at GloomBoomDoom.com. He's speaking to us from Chiang Mai, Thailand. Mark, welcome back to This Week in Money. Well, thank you very much for having me on your program, and good day to all your listeners and viewers. Mark, how are things at the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report, and how can people subscribe? 
just say everything yeah. is okay. Thank you very much. The Dow is trading around 40,000. Do you see a 50,000 Dow? Well, that depends how much money the Fed will print. And so we have to ask the Fed about that. But if uh, the Dow goes to from 40 to 50,000, I suppose that gold and silver will outperform the Dow Jones. Gold is at new all-time highs. Does it look like gold could go for a run, and do you have price targets for this year and next year? I don't have a price target because I don't know what goes through the head of the arranged central bankers. But I know that if you print money, the purchasing power of money goes down, and then the currency weakens. But because all the central banks in the world they do the same. They all print money. The dollar may not weaken a lot against uh, Japanese yen or euro or British pound, but it may weaken more against gold, silver, platinum. When gold becomes a speculation instead of a store of wealth, would you be on the sell side? Yes, uh, but uh, the speculation phase can last a long time. And if I look at the pattern of the recent breakout in gold prices, it was not accompanied by a lot of speculation. On the contrary, individuals reduced their future positions and institutional investors, they were completely disinterested in gold. So the speculative phase, when I compare, say, gold to bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies, the speculative phase is not yet upon us. Silver's trading around half of its all-time high. What's going on with silver? Well, the all-time high was maybe an exaggeration because it was subject to manipulation. But it is true that silver is relatively low, and uh, platinum is also at about half the level it used to be. So there are other commodities including agricultural commodities that are much cheaper than gold. But uh, gold has a specific uh, quality, and uh, that is uh, that it is essentially true money. So the value of gold is uh, consistent in terms of purchasing power. If you look at the gold price, say, 1950, if you look at the price level today, and at the price level in 1950, gold has gone up about the same amount as the price level. So, and for most people, it's easier <coughs> to store gold than to store 10 tons of wheat. How important is it to watch the commitment of traders when looking to invest in commodities? Well, I, I think that the commitment of traders can signal major lows. I mean, I wrote several times about crude oil in uh, November, December, and January because the commercials were had uh, reduced their short position meaningfully. In other words, usually when they have such a low exposure on the short side, the market bottoms out. And this is then what happens. In the very long run, I don't think that the commitment of traders or of commercials is all that important because, uh, say, you're a gold producer, you produce a quantity is a million ounces of gold every year and the price is high as it is now relative to the production cost is only natural that you sell forward in the futures market but in general a short a small short exposure by commercials is bullish in general but i can also give you exceptions but anyway uh, it's a complex matter in some cases one should pay a lot of attention, and in other cases, not so much attention. <laughs> with governments making it tougher and tougher to mine, for example, Canada with UNDRIP, could concerns of less product supply and demand cause mining stocks working in specific jurisdictions to run significantly higher than others? Yes. Uh, I mean, for me, the Canadian government doesn't really exist because it's, uh, it's an, a government that is, has gone mad, the deranged, and uh, they do everything to essentially diminish the standards of living of hard-working Canadians. But the point is, regulation in general 
will increase the cost of everything, of services and of industrial production and so forth, because more and more regulation demands more and more supervision and compliance officers and so forth and so on. So actually the recent inflation we had is uh, not entirely, but largely produced actually by governments. Yeah, there's been a, a secret RCMP report that's been revealed that says governments should be aware that once Canadians realize how poor they are, there will be a widespread unrest. Any thoughts on that? Let's hope so. Let's hope so. I think it's about time that people uh, kick out Mr. Trudeau. Uh, they can cast their vote. Uh, they, the problem is that people have voted for these incompetent people. Maybe the opponents of Trudeau are even more incompetent. I don't know. But it's difficult to envision someone who would be more incompetent than he is. The U.S. dollar's been moving higher. Is it still the go-to currency in uncertain times? No, as I just explained to you, I think the currency that you should hold now and always is gold. It is the only true currency that cannot be printed that keeps its value. The dollar is strong because the other currencies are even more, uh, are even weaker, or the fundamentals are even worse. Do you think inflation money printing is headed higher? And what do you think the real rate of inflation is? Uh, to measure inflation is very difficult. But there are statisticians who are very good at that, like John Williams. And uh, the rate of inflation, for sure, that I can say with, without any question. The rate of cost of living increase of the average family in the world or in Canada or in the U.S. or in Europe is higher than what the governments publish. That is for sure. The Agenda 2030 tagline is you'll own nothing and be happy. To make this evil dream come true, are real estate markets likely to be crashed by design leading to economic collapse? Well, I think it's very difficult in uh, countries with property rights to expropriate people. So, and I think the Davos crowd, the people that gather in Davos every year and lecture the world how they should rule the world and so forth, I think this is a phenomenon that is waning. In other words, it will disappear. People don't pay attention to them anymore. And uh, I don't think that in uh, the large countries of the world, uh, people will be expropriated. Now, there can be an expropriation through inflation. In other words, you're a poor guy. You earn, say, $30,000 a year or 40000 The percentage you pay on necessities, you know, it's on food, on insurance, on pharmaceuticals, on health care and so forth, as a percent of the income is very high. If you earn $10 million a year, the food is irrelevant. You know, you don't care whether spaghetti costs 20% more or less because you're not going to eat a lot of spaghetti anyway. And so uh, the poor people can be essentially impoverished as they have been. That I want to make very clear. The standards of living of the typical Canadian has been going down for the last 20 years or so because his wage has gone up less then his cost of living. Are we likely to see price inflation in some things and deflation in other things going forward? This is always happening in the world with some assets going up and some assets going down. This is also the viciousness of inflation that not all prices move in the same direction with the same intensity. So, as you know, commercial properties in America and those in Canada are going down at the present time in value. But residential has still gone up in most places. In Canada, less so. In Canada, there has been some break in, commer in uh, residential property prices already, but they're still very high. So I think they may lo go lower. Stocks may also go lower at some point, massively. Where do you think a lot of money can be made in inflationary times? Well... I mean, some people have made a lot of money in bitcoins, 
and other cryptocurrencies. And uh, I never bought gold to make money, but to preserve the purchasing power of money. So I think that uh, your listeners should also own some gold. As I have said for the last 20 years, I may point out. Some of the big automakers are pulling back on production of electric vehicles, although Tesla just built its sixth millionth vehicle, and EV sales overall continue to increase. We're hearing of gigafactories and even terrafactories popping up everywhere. Is this growth and demand for product bullish for lithium and the battery metals sector? Well, lithium has come down a lot, but I think the big boom in electric vehicles is uh, essentially over. I think people realize slowly that it's, of course, a complete uh, nuisance to buy an electric car and go to a charging station that is powered by coal or diesel. (laughs) You understand? That doesn't make any sense. So a lot of this environmental thing belongs in the history of uh, extraordinary popular delusions and the madness of crowds. Governments are taking away or trying to take away freedom of speech. Is this a bad sign for the future? It is a disastrous sign, and especially that it's happening by, uh, by bureaucrats in democracies. You understand? If the king says, I don't want anyone to talk badly about me. I can understand that. But a democracy actually is built upon the expression of the views of different people and their votes. In other words, uh, people have a choice to vote for Mr. A and Mr. Z and Mr. X, Y, Z and so forth. But that requires an infrastructure where people can express their views. So someone who stands for election, he has to communicate to me, to Mark Faber, I will do this, this, this. Of course, they all lie, so you can't believe them anyway. But the direction, whether they're socialists or communists or more leaning towards the capitalistic system, is important to know for the voters. And uh, when they take the freedom of speech away, uh, they take away essentially any uh, opposition. They eliminate the opposition. Yes, the uh, Trudeau government's proposed online hate bill has a maximum penalty of life in prison. Is that a real chilling prospect? Well, as I said, he's mad. He's deranged. Emergency use authorized medical procedures over the past three years, along with mass illegal immigration or changing Western countries. What do you think Western countries will look like and be like five and even ten years from now? There is a law in economics about money. It's the Gresham law. And uh, essentially, bad money destroyed, destroys good money. And when a society is inundated by people that are not uh, apt, to live in a democracy, then the system will eventually deteriorate. And we have this uh, in the U.S. and in Europe, an increase in the crime rate. The government will, of course, deny this, but the fact is simply that a lot of people get knocked off (laughs) by immigrants and so forth. And uh, in my opinion, countries or empires, we have the Western Empire, Originally, the U.K. and France, and then Germany, and the U.S. Uh, this Western hegemony in the world is not being destroyed from the outside, but from the inside. So this is my view. And investors should consider that, that they invest also in other countries than in this Western hemisphere. From the outside looking in, how does Canada look? Well, I always went to Canada and I gave speeches and told them, I'm just coming from the U.S. It's such a lovely country. It's like going from hell to heaven. But I wouldn't be able to say this nowadays, especially the government of Trudeau has destroyed a lot. We're here in Vancouver, Canada. Evidently, Vancouver is a C40 city as well as a 15-minute city along with a number of surrounding suburbs. How important will it likely be to not be living in a C40 city and or a 15-minute city? 
uh, I put it this way. If uh, things become really bad in the world, you want to have food and you want to have water. And uh, the best chance uh, for food and water is to live in very small villages in the countryside, not in big cities. Because in big cities, you know, if they switch off the Internet, if they switch off electricity, uh, you're going to, hey, looting will be the order of the day. I mean, you better buy a machete <laughs> in this situation. And an armor from the Middle Ages, an iron armor. And uh, so in the countryside, you're better off. And there in the countryside, the property price is also lower than in the cities. Do you think governments are trying to get their populations to rebel by design, for example, making Easter Sunday Trans Visibility Day? I repeat what I said. The governments are mad. This whole transgender business is the, the most ridiculous thing because the percentage of people who are transgender is, in, is very small. Is election fraud the elephant in the room that's ushering in the takedown of the Western world? Uh, the takedown of the Western world takes a long time. and But one thing is clear. Whether Trump gets elected or Biden, the money printing will continue and the fiscal deficits will not go down. They'll expand. Just consider the unfunded liabilities. So uh, I think it doesn't really matter. Overall, do you see gloom, boom, or doom ahead? Look, the world is always characterized by sectors that do relatively well and stocks that go up and by sectors that do relatively badly and by stocks that go down and some companies go bankrupt and then some prices go up like cocoa recently and some prices go down and then they bottom out and then they go up again and so forth. So it's always gloom, boom, and doom. <laughs> it's not just now. It's always. But uh, I, I think that I have explained to your listeners on countless occasions to diversify. And I repeat this. You have to own some real estate, some stocks, some cash and bonds, and some precious metals. And if you don't own any precious metals, you're naive. You trust the central bankers and your government. As simple as that. When we see you on video, you have a bust behind you on the bookshelf. Who is that bust of? Uh, Ho Chi Minh. Where'd you get it? Ho Chi Minh, the leader of Vietnam, the nationalist leader of Vietnam. And why him? I have an extensive collection of socialist, communist, and especially Mao Zedong memorabilia. There are hundreds of posters, hundreds of books, and badges, and buttons, and everything. So I, I just collect, I used to collect it when I lived in Hong Kong. Now, given uh, my life expect, expectancy, I don't need to collect many things anymore. <laughs> Mark, where can people follow you and subscribe to the Gloom, Boom, and Doom report? They can go with pleasure uh, to the website gloomboomdoom.com. I repeat, www.gloomboomdoom.com, all in one word, gloom, boom, doom. Mark, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. It's always my pleasure, Jim. <laughs> and take care. And to your viewers, enjoy the day. Enjoy the moment. Enjoy every day. My guest has been Dr. Mark Faber, publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report. He was speaking to us from Chiang Mai, Thailand. Coming up, Martin Straith, next on This Week in Money. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated. Trades on the TSX Venture AMY. On the OTCQB AMYZF. And Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclico.com or phone us at 
574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Martin Strait, founder of Trend News Online at thetrendletter.com. He's speaking to us from Coquitlam, British Columbia, which is just east of Vancouver. Welcome back to This Week in Money. Well, thanks for having me, Jim. Most analysts are calling for lower interest rates later this year. What's your take on interest rates and the bond market? Well, I, I think the markets, you know, they've been waiting impatiently for the Fed and Bank of Canada and pretty much, I guess, all central banks to start cutting rates. You know, we started the year with the expectations of, you know, six and even, was it, seven rate cuts in the U.S. But then the inflation numbers, especially in the U.S., kept, you know, staying higher, you know, what they call it, sticky. Um, and then the Fed would like to see. So, you know, recent expectations, now we're starting to see, you know, maybe three Fed cuts. You know, today, this morning, we just got the, both the U.S. and Canadian job data, um, and that helps kind of paint a, a picture of the differences between the two countries. You know, the U.S. saw a job increase of 303,000, so beating expectation, and their unemployment rate dropped down to 3.8%. Now, we should remember here that of the 303,000 jobs, most were part-time, and most of the full-time jobs were government, which is a really um, dangerous trend we're seeing in Canada and the U.S., you know. Government jobs are not considered very productive. Now, in Canada, um, you know, as the U.S. had, you know, their unemployment went down to 3.8. Ours went from 5.8 up to 6.1. So, so things are, you know, again, between these two countries, they're quite different. And now more troubling for those hoping for the Fed to t- start cutting rates is that we've seen the bond market trend down, meaning rates have been rising, and that's been across the board. So we're seeing like the two-year, the five, the 10, and the 30-year bond, the yields have been rising. Now, this week, we've heard from many of the Fed members. Um, most are concerned about inflation, some suggesting that they would only do one rate cut this year, and even one member saying that they shouldn't do any rate cuts this year if inflation stays sticky. So two weeks ago, we saw the Swiss uh, central bank cut rates by 25 basis points. I suspect that the ECB, the Bank of Canada, they're going to cut rates sooner than the Fed. You know, if the U.S. got strong employment data, you know, we got higher energy prices. Those are both inflationary. So I expect the Fed's going to disappoint many people who are expecting at least three cuts this year. And again, I do expect the Bank of Canada uh, and the ECB are probably going to cut before the Fed. On Thursday, major stock markets put in an outside reversal. What is an outside reversal, and what could it mean for the markets? Yeah. Um, Yeah, now, for people that aren't familiar with it, an outside reversal is often a a very reliable indicator of a trend change. Now, you know, we're we're the trend letter, trend technical trader, trend disruptors. We watch trends. So when we get a bearish outside reversal, that it happens when a stock price for the current day is both higher and lower than the previous day, and then it closes lower than the previous day. Now, I know that sounds like quite a mouthful, but so, for example, so the S&P 500 on Wednesday, it had a high of 52.28, a low of 5194, and it closed at 52.11. And then yesterday, it opened higher so 5244, and then it even moved higher than that, up to 5256. But at that point, it plunged almost 100 points, and it closed at 5147. So yesterday, it went higher than the previous day's close and and high, and it went lower than the previous day's low. So that's that's not a good sign. So it's a bearish signal, and if the S&P 500 now does not make a new high soon, and that means it has to trade above 52.63, then that would be a very bearish signal. Now, you have to also remember here that yesterday, both the Dow and the NASDAQ also had outside reversals. So we've got every major market in the U.S. has had an outside reversal yesterday. Now, here's something that's, to me, uh, really interesting. So four weeks ago, March 8th, 
And it, and it was the last time I was on your show. So at the end of that, after we recorded, at the end of the day, NVIDIA had an outside reversal. So we're talking four weeks ago. So I consider that such an important event that we created a short video highlighting what that would mean for the markets. And then last, I guess it was last week, we provided an update. So your listeners can, uh, you know, if they want to see these videos, they're very short. Um, they're, they're under 10 and 5 minutes. Um, just go go to YouTube. Just Google YouTube and the trend letter. Because I think every investor should see these to understand what, be, what might be happening here. You know, NVIDIA has been the leader in this bull market. And so to us, this is a very important thing to be aware of. Because now today, like I say, we've now had all the major markets also experience an outside reversal. And so that further suggests to me that NVIDIA is potentially leading the market lower. So NVIDIA led the market higher. It could also now be leading it lower. So today it was really interesting because the market actually opened higher today, which well I found quite surprising given that the U.S. job data came in hotter than usual or expected. And then the oil prices keep rising, and both of those are inflationary. So now the reason that we focus on NVIDIA again is simply because it's been the rock star, you know, the, the poster child for the stock market. So if NVIDIA has a solid correction, then it very likely will bring down the, the tech sector, and that will very likely bring down the general market. So we're still bullish long term, but this could be the waterfall correction that we've been warning about for the last month. So if we look at why the S&P, the Dow, and the NASDAQ all had outside reversals yesterday, there was a lot of stuff happening yesterday. You know, firstly, we've got the markets have been overbought for almost the whole year. Um, we had Israel's bombing of the Iranian consult, uh, consulate in uh, Syria. And then this morning, we see that the, the CIA has warned Israel that Iran plans to attack within the next 48 hours. And then to top that off, we had the U.S. Secretary of State announce that Ukraine will become a member of NATO. Now, think about that. If that were to happen, that would mean that NATO is bringing in Ukraine. Ukraine is at war with Russia. That would mean that Canada, the U.S., U.K., France, Germany, and the 27 other European countries would all be at war with Russia. I mean, we're talking World War III here. So there's a lot happening here, and investors need to be on alert. You've been writing lately that there's a rotation developing out of big tech and into things like natural resources. What are you seeing? Well, what we're seeing and have been talking about for the last month or so is that inflation, again, is still sticky. And in the U.S. especially, you, know, you had the consumer price index and the producer price index both come in much hotter than expected. And, you know, as we just mentioned, the U.S. employment data was strong. So now what we're seeing is the inflation-type sectors are booming. So we're seeing natural resources, energy, precious metals, and other commodities. And then on the other side of that, we've seen the biggest losers being interest-sensitive stocks. So we're talking, you know, sectors like solar, home construction, retail, biotech, uh, small caps. They all headed lower this week. And that's also included many of the Magnificent Seven stocks. So, you know, Tesla, Apple, and NVIDIA, as we were just talking about. So they've all been down this week. And I think we're going to see many of these natural resource stocks, and while we already have seen it, they've been starting to catch a bid here. So I think big tech stocks and very likely crypto may be taking a breather here. Now, last month when I was on, I said we were starting to see a rotation from tech away from software, you know, cloud storage, cybersecurity, internet, social media, those momentum stocks. And that's what we've been seeing now in the last few weeks. And so also, you know, while gold has done well, people need to understand that if we see the equity markets get hit, gold and silver stocks are going to get hit as well. And if all this plays out, I think we're going to have some really good buying opportunities. You know, concern that inflation is still too high, for the Fed has made the markets nervous. And, you know, as noted, yesterday we saw the S&P close below previous low, which is a bearish indicator. And we also saw the Dow do that. We also saw the NASDAQ do that. So as discussed, I mean, we've been watching the video very closely to see if it triggers this waterfall sell-off that we've been watching for. 
How have your crude oil trades been doing, and what do you see ahead for crude? Well, yeah, crude's, well, crude's been on a real skid from, you know, what was it, October to, uh, I think it was December, where it fell from 95 down to 68. You know, it had a real tough time breaking through 78 resistance. You know, it, it tried from, what, early November to late February, tried six different times, but it could not break through it. But then it did. And so now, if it can keep moving higher and use 78 as a support level where it was resistance before, that would be very bullish. You know, today, um, oil was trading up just under $87. So we could easily see a push, you know, 90, 95 or higher. Um, very possible. So, yeah, we bought, uh, you know, a number of oil and gas stocks back, I guess, about a year ago when oil had uh, it hit its previous triple bottom at $66, $68 range. And that triggered a, a buy signal from our models. So we took some profits on those as they hit, you know, close to their highs. But now all of those stocks are rallying again. Um, I think it was last time, I guess the time before, back in December, we added an oil ETF when oil was uh, trading around $70. So again, that trade's worked out really well as well. So looking at seasonality, uh, oil is following its historic pattern pretty nicely here. Um, oil typically starts its best seasonal period around mid-February, and it runs right to the end of June. And, and, you know, it's been just tracking that beautifully so far. So we'll see if that pattern can, can stay. If so, uh, we would we'd likely see that oil ETF and those energy stocks have a really nice run here. Um, longer term, you know, if you look at demand, um, you know, demand's growing, especially in these emerging countries. Um, you know, you got India, you know, 14% of its 1.4 billion people don't have electricity. Um, the International um, Energy Agency says that India is going to overtake China in the next two years, and it's going to become the biggest driver of oil demand. And now, again, remember, you, there's, there's a billion people in the world that still don't have electricity. And we keep hearing, you know, we hear all these governments and the COP28 people saying, you know, we don't need oil anymore because we're all going to be driving EVs in the next, you know, 10 years. But, you know, they seem to forget that oil is such a major, major component of our everyday life. You know, you're talking your clothes, your smartphone, your computer, your construction material, your shoes, medical supplies. I mean, tires for those EV cars, you know, the asphalt roads that these EVs will be driving on. All of these things are going to continue to be needed. And remember, these, these people in these emerging countries, they want this stuff. They want cell phones. They want good shoes. They want all that. So the need for oil is not going away. Now, if you look at supply, you know, the lack of investment, you know, continues to drop. Capital expenditures are at, you know, 30-year lows. Rig counts are dropping. You know, why is that? Well, you've got, you know, governments and the COP28 crowd, you know, they're telling us we don't need or want fossil fuels. So what have they done? They've increased taxes, windfall taxes, uh, regulations. They've, they've allowed no new permitting. I mean, this is a simple, you know, supply-demand cycle thing. You know, when you increase demand and you have a global concerted effort to squeeze supply, you're going to have a supply problem for years. So we expect we're going to see $100 oil, you know, very likely even sooner than I thought, and likely 150 and higher over the next few years. How's natural gas looking? Well, <laughs> natural gas is incredibly volatile. You know, it, it's heavily affected by weather and geopolitical events. You know, we saw it go from $1.50 during COVID up to, what, nine fifty after Russia invaded Ukraine. And then we had oversupply, mild winters. And we saw it drop back from that 950 down to about 150. So currently it's trading in this wedge pattern. So we need to see if it's going to break either up or down. I mean, hopefully up. Uh, based on seasonality, it should go up starting in March. We typically see that that's, you know, natural gas's best seasonal period with a nice run into early mid June. Now, in the longer term, one of the things that we're keeping an eye on is that with all these massive data centers being built to service AI, there's going to be this massive increase in need for more electricity. And at some point, natural gas should run higher. And the other big one we're watching is hedge funds 
are massively short natural gas right now. So if we see any kind of upward movement, um, prices should spike because those short sellers are going to need to cover their positions. Gold continues to be hitting new highs. Previously, when you were on the show, you had gold targets of $3,000 and $3,200 for this year. Do you see a new target for gold in 2024? Yeah, so... It seems every time I come on your show, gold has risen another $100 in that month. You know, from mid-January, gold's up about 16%. You know, it's up, uh, last I looked, it was up almost 40 bucks again today. So last month, I suggested gold was breaking out in this kind of slow motion move, which no one be, you know, was really aware of other than the gold bugs and people that were invested in it. But that's all starting to change now. I mean, gold's been bouncing around for five years, but now it's got these good fundamental, technical, and pretty much every other tailwind behind it. You know, the key here is gold's in this kind of new high territory, and there's really no defined technical resistance right now. I mean, we could wake up tomorrow, and gold could be up another 200 bucks. So gold's starting to, you know, starting to catch people's attention. And, you know, it would only take such a minute increment in the average person's portfolio to see gold just skyrocket. So now gold's very overbought right here, so a pullback would certainly not be a shock. Um, gold action is suggesting that investors are finally waking up to these massive debts that the U.S. and most other governments are cranking up, and that's inflationary, and that reduces purchasing power of those currencies. So it's not just the U.S. dollar, it's all fiat currencies. And if you look at a chart of gold you know, versus the Canadian dollar, the euro, the Japanese yen, pretty much any country, it's off the charts. So, and of course, the other very big factor in gold's rise is the action from central banks. You know, we've got countries that don't trust the West. So you've got countries like China, Russia, Iran, et cetera. They've all been loading up on gold. And then gold's also been benefiting as investors are, you know, betting on that the U.S. is going to cut rates at some point this year. Now, gold's very overbought here. So look for a nice pullback. Get in, you know, add to your position. Uh, gold stocks have just finally started been rallying. You know, they're still lagging behind the uh, bullion, but they have been moving nicely lately. Now, as I said, gold's overbought here. So if we get a nice correction, uh, we'll be looking to add uh, more bullion via the ETFs. Um, now, again, remember, if we do see a correction in the stock market, uh, we would very likely see those gold and silver stocks pull back as well. But overall, Jim, yeah, I think that we're going to, you know, gold's already had a really good run this year. But, you know, 3000 3200 it would not surprise me. Well, gold's been on a parabolic run. Bitcoin has been very volatile this year. What do you see ahead for Bitcoin? Yeah, yeah. I mean, crypto is it's wild. You know, it's by far the most volatile, polarizing sector. You know, you've got, you've got people at one end of the spectrum, you know, who think that this is the greatest trading vehicle ever. And then you have the Jimmy Dine, Jimmy Dines, or sorry, Jimmy Diamonds, um, who say that Bitcoin's like pet rock. You know, it's worth nothing. But you're correct. Like, while well, gold is acting like it's been shot out of a cannon, you know, Bitcoin's kind of moved in these huge gyrations. You know, trading lately between sixty-two and seventy-two thousand dollars. I think the big question, you know, investors are struggling with with Bitcoin is: is Bitcoin a risk asset like gold, or is it something else? And like I said, when you look at a chart, it's just, it's wild. I mean, Bitcoin peaked back in October 2021 at 67,000. And then it went right to the end of uh, 2022. It fell to 16,5. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a drop of $50,000. But then when Sam uh, Bankman fried, he got rested for the fraud related collapse of the crypto exchange, you know, that FTX. Bitcoin started to rally, and then it rallied for most of 2023. And then when the Hamas attacked Israel, Bitcoin shot up to 50000 bucks again. And then we had that ETF launch uh, a few months ago, and that was, you know, that was a classic buy the rumor, sell the news story, as Bitcoin then fell from that 50 k down to 40 k But then it spiked up again, up to 72 k which it's been testing now for a couple times. So... When you see that kind of volatility, that tells me that you've got incredible strong conviction from both the sellers and the buyers to their particular viewpoint. So what's happening is, 
you know, whenever we get a downturn, the sellers pile in and they sell like crazy. And then the buyers consider any dip, uh, you know, a, a super buying opportunity and they buy every pullback. So right now, I would not be surprised to see Bitcoin fall all the way back to that EC, ETF launch of around 50K. And, you know, and I, I expect this volatility to continue. And I think buying the dips makes sense. Now, one of the things that's char- changed for Bitcoin is that they, we now have these institutional money coming in here. So we've got these institutional managers. They need to show gains. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens for the next little while with Bitcoin. Because if we do see a big drop back down to that 50K level, um, those institutional investors are not likely to hold on to an asset that's going to drop 40 or 50%. Now, I don't have any skin in the game right now with cryptos, but I'm certainly a very keen observer, and we're looking for an entry point to get back in. What is Bitcoin backed by, and does it worry you? Well, well, Bitcoin's decentralized, right? So that means that it's not controlled by any single entity. So it's not like a, cent- a central bank can control it. It's, it's, you know, instead it relies on this network of computers, or you know, call them nodes, and it's distributed globally. So what it is is these nodes then validate transactions and they maintain a public ledger on the blockchain. So I see Bitcoin and other cryptos, they've been gaining mainstream support, primarily based on investors finally starting to realize that these federal governments are spending at outrageous levels and that spending is inflationary and it causes purchasing power of those currencies to decline. So as the U.S. debt just, you know, it recently passed $34 trillion. And that number seems to have actually caught some attention. And I think people are really starting to wake up here. You know, in Canada, our debt is not as bad, but it's still unsustainable. And in, in order to pay these debts, these governments simply print more money. And that's further decreasing the purchasing power of each dollar. So unlike the Canadian or U.S. dollar, With Bitcoin, there is a limited supply, and that scarcity contributes to its value. So I think Bitcoin's popularity, going mainstream, obviously these ETFs have really opened things up, has really got these governments and central banks really concerned. Because we've got almost every Western central bank now has initiated a project to create their own digitized currency. And what they want to do is they want to be able to control and track every transaction we make. And if every transaction we make is tracked, then it's going to be really easy for them to apply taxes and levies, whatever they want, to every transaction we make. So, you know, right now, if you're paying your babysitter or you're giving your child an allowance, you just give them some cash. Well, that could become taxable under a digital currency. And it's going to be really interesting to see how these governments will try to outlaw crypto because they don't like it because this is, they have no control over it. And I, they've been watching China, and in China, they can restrict you from making certain purchases, and they can restrict you from movement. And I think this is really a scary moment if we get these digital currencies, and they're pushing hard for them. Yeah, I just saw an article in China now, if you don't have what the government calls a certain social credit score, you're not allowed to charge your electric car. Yeah, and you're not allowed to travel, and you're not. You know, there's. You're, they they totally can limit every every you know yuan that you spend. So, and and you just think, you know, these countries, the Western countries that are so indebted, they can see this like all everyone. Just think if they could apply like a GST transaction fee five percent to every single transaction that is not you know a current like a retail sale now. So every time you hand money to a friend or lend somebody something, whatever, they could, they could, you know, add a levy to it. Could you see a black market currency being developed to get around it? Just like cigarettes were used as currency in prisons? Yeah, I think, you know, the, you know, people are, people are crafting. I mean, obviously Bitcoin and the cryptos have become this kind of really standardized way to kind of get off the grid a bit and, and get out of government's eyesight. And that's, that's the key. I think that this day and age with, you know, AI and all the technolo- technological advances, I don't think it will necessarily be like cigarettes or whatever, but certainly, uh, you know, anything worth value, like maybe chocolate bars, like cocoa has gone crazy, right? So anything of value could be used to barter. 
Your thoughts on the U.S. dollar and the Canadian dollar? Well, you know, I say this all the time. With currencies, it's, it's really all about the U.S. dollar. You know, when the U.S. dollar is strong, typically that's a negative effect on most other, other currencies, commodities, equities, and precious metals. And then when it's weak, then those other things rally. Now, the interesting thing here is that the U.S. dollar has been an uptrend since the year started. But so have many of the commodities and precious metals, which is very bullish for natural resources. So as we noted earlier, when we we're talking about the bond market, you know, the U.S. bond yields have been rising as the bond market is now questioning just how aggressive the Fed is going to be in cutting rates. And I said earlier, when we're discussing those bonds, I believe that the Fed will be slower to cut rates than the Bank of Canada or the ECB or any other central bank. So longer term, we expect the U.S. economy to be stronger than most others, and that would mean the U.S. dollar will be stronger. So, that, you know, it's that old, you know, the least ugly house in the block or the least dirty shirt in the laundry basket. So 2024, you know, it's going to be a wild ride. You know, we've got 64 countries that are having elections this year, and on, in almost every election in the last year, the ruling government, the government in power, has been given the boot. So you can expect a lot of civil unrest this year. And then, of course, we've got the granddaddy of them all. We've got the U.S. election coming. And, you know, an absolute gong show that's going to be. And massive civil unrest, I'm sure. So with global civil unrest, we expect to see capital is going to flow to the U.S. dollar for safety. Now, many people could consider that counterintuitive. You know, the U.S. is a gong show. How could that be? Well, it's the reserve currency, and every time there is trouble, concern, people need safety, they always go to the reserve currency. So it's so important for all your listeners, for all investors to understand how these things are connected. So near-term support, the U.S. dollar sitting right now at 104.28. 105 is its next resistance. 102 is its key support. Now, for the Canadian like I say, I mean, it's all connected to the U.S. dollar. So since late December, the Canadian's been trending lower, uh, bounced a bit recently, but it's been really disappointing. You know, you consider the big moves in oil, gold, and most, you know, so many natural resources and commodities. So the Canadian dollar has not performed very well. And as I mentioned earlier, the Canadian economy is much weaker than the U.S., Therefore, we expect the Bank of Canada is going to cut rates before the Fed does and likely cut rates more often. And that's going to cause the Canadian dollar to fall versus the U.S. dollar. So Canadian dollar right now is trading at 73.60, um, key resistance 75.80, uh, next support would be 73.25. But long term, Jim, um, I think the Canadian dollar is probably going to drop below 70 over the next year. Martin, where can people follow you and subscribe to The Trend Letter? Well, they can just go to thetrendletter.com. So that's all one word, thetrendletter.com. Um, so we've got the three services. Well, we have, actually, we have four. So there's The Trend Letter. So that's been around for 23 years now. Uh, long-term investors wanting to understand what drives the market, covers everything, equities, currencies, precious metals, commodities, and bonds. Uh, trend technical trader, again, for, for active and longer term uh, investors, started as a hedging service, but now also does long positions. Again, covers equities, precious metals, commodities, and it includes our gold technical indicator. And then you have trend disruptors, um, very speculative, risk capital. Um, this service, you know, invests in disruptive ideas, AI, obviously, virtual augmented reality, 5G, cloud, Internet of Things. We just closed the trade yesterday, you know, 120% in just over three months. That's the kind of thing you can get in these in these uh, really speculative areas. And we also have our free headline service. So that's where we review what's happening in the markets every morning. And then we send out headlines that we feel investors should be aware of. Uh, readers can simply, you know, read the headline and if they want to get all the details, they can just simply click on the link and read the article. Um, also, Jim, if people want to see those NVIDIA YouTubes, again, they're very short. One's about nine minutes, one's about four and a half. Um, I think it would be a bit of an eye opener and it really might tell you what's going to come here. And again, to subscribe to anything, go to the trendletter.com. 
any questions they, uh, any of your listeners have, just email us at info at thetrendletter.com. Martin, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Uh, my pleasure as always, Jim. Have a great weekend. My guest has been Martin Straith, founder of Trend News Online at thetrendletter.com. He was speaking to us from Coquitlam, B.C. Our conversation took place on April 5th. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Dr. Mark Faber, and Martin Straith. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show or for our guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Now stand by for a company showcase update from the Director of Marketing for Recyclico, Tony Mitchell. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. My guest is Tony Mitchell, Director of Marketing for Recyclico. Tony, welcome back to Company Showcase. Hi, Jim. How are things with Recyclico's Taiwan joint venture after Wednesday's earthquake? Well, uh, first off, Jim, we at Recyclico send our thoughts and prayers to everyone in Taiwan affected by the earthquake, and specifically those in, ar- in and around the city of uh, Huailian which was closest to the epicenter of this latest quake. Thankfully, everyone at uh, Zenith Chemical Corporation, our joint venture partners located in uh, Taichung, which is over 80 kilometers away, felt the quake, but did not experience the same intensity as those in uh, Huailin. In fact, a member of our team was on a conference call with Zenith uh, the moment it occurred, and from their boots-on-the-ground report in Taichung, there was no damage at all. So while we feel for those who weren't so fortunate. We're all quite grateful that it did not affect our plans in any way. Um, But, you know, all that said, I think it's important for people to realize that Taiwan, as well as ourselves here on the west coast of Canada and others located on or near fault lines around the world, regularly experience quakes of one magnitude or another. And as earthquakes have become a fact of life for those, you know, living in these regions, it makes for a highly resilient people who will recover from this event as they have countless times before. For those who are unfamiliar with what RecycleCo is doing in Taiwan, can you give us a quick overview? Certainly, Jim. We at RecycleCo have a highly innovative patented process for recovering valuable battery materials locked within lithium-ion battery waste, such as battery production scrap, end-of-life batteries, and so on. Since we've been proving we can do this since 2016, And in fact, we have a a 500-kilogram-a-day demonstration plant here in Richmond, B.C., where we test materials from test partner facilities around the globe. Our goal is to install and operate via joint venture agreement our modular recycling and upcycling clean spot plants within or alongside battery production and recycling facilities worldwide. That said, uh, Zenith Chemical Corporation is the first such joint venture partner we are uh, working with to install our $25 million U.S. dollar uh, clean spot plant and process 2,000 metric tons of black mass per year into battery-grade materials. Zenith made a lot of sense for us to, you know, joint venture with strategically as they are highly respected in the battery industry and have deep experience and inroads in supplying major battery factories throughout Asia, where the bulk of battery production still takes place for the world today and to come. So we're currently in the middle of firming up design details prior to commencing fabrication and ultimately commissioning our first clean spot operations in Taichung late next year. Where are you traded and where can people get more information about the company? We're traded on the TSX Venture under the ticker symbol AMY, on the OTCQB under the ticker symbol AMYZF, and on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol ID4. And you can get more information on our website at uh, RecycleCode.com. Tony, thank you so much for the update. Thank you, Jim. My guest has been Tony Mitchell, Director of Marketing for RecycleCo. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on April 4th. 
Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.